Hello, and thank you for joining me for the second half of chapter 19 in Intermediate Accounting. We are talking about stock options in this chapter. And if you haven't checked out the first video, make sure you watch that one first so you know what we're talking about. So we left off talking about stock option plans, and we're going to pick up with talking about how some of those plans actually have performance measurements with those. So it might have to do with the manager reaching a certain level of sales, or it could have something to do with the market conditions. So those stock options would specify that, and um, the company's going to assess whether or not they meet those objectives. And the idea here is that the employee doesn't just have to work there to, to earn these options, they actually have to improve the company in order to get this incentive. So our example that we're going to look at is that an option might not be met, it might not be um, exercisable until that performance measurement is met. So like we said, it could be performance-based or market-based. All right, so how do we recognize performance-based options? This is not having to do with how long they've been at the company necessarily, but whether or not they meet their performance obligations. So first we have to consider, do we think it's actually probable that they are going to meet their target? And so in the first example we're gonna look at, we're gonna see that we don't think it's gonna happen. Um, and then ultimately we have to see whether or not they do meet that target. So let's look at this example. In January 1st, 2018, Universal Communications grants options that permit key executives to acquire 10 million of the company's $1 par common shares. The fair value of the options is $8 per option. The initial expectation is that it is not probable that sales will increase by 10% after four years. That's too bad. They made an incentive that they do not think the managers are going to be able to achieve. So that's too bad. Hopefully you work at a company that they actually have achievable measurements. But since they do not think they're going to be able to achieve this 10% increase, then we, yeah, we use the $8 option, but we multiply it by zero. The chance of that is zero. So really we don't have to recognize any compensation expense. So that happened and that was in um, 2018. At January 1st, 2018, we've got the same thing going on, but after three years, they say the estimate is probable. Actually, it looks like they are gonna reach their 10% increase after four years. Well, that's too bad because on January 1st, 2018, we didn't record anything. We didn't record anything in 2019. Here we are in 2020 and we say, oh, actually, I think they are gonna meet that. So what we would have done was multiplied the 10 million shares times the $8 option. And if we thought it was gonna be probable back in 2018, we would have taken that 80 million that we calculate divided by the four years. And we would have gone ahead and shown compensation expense of $20 million each year. But since we didn't do that, we didn't think it was probable, we're gonna to have to make up for that. So we're gonna to have to take the 10 million shares times the $8 option, we get 80 million times three out of the four years, because at this point, three of the four years have already passed. So in other words, 75% of it, we're gonna go ahead and show as compensation expense now. We're subtracting zero because up until this point, we haven't recognized any compensation expense. So we will debit compensation expense for all three years worth. 80 million, if we would have divided that by all four years, it would have been 20 million each year, but we didn't. So we're gonna recognize a whole 60 million, three years worth now. And then we're gonna credit paid in capital stock options. And then after the fourth year, then we say, yep, it still looks like it's gonna work out. So we're gonna take that final 20 million. Remember we had 80 million total, the 10 million shares, times the $8 option that they calculated. And now all four years have passed, but we've now already shown compensation expense of 60 million. So that leaves 20 million left over that we need to expense out. That's that fourth year. So now we have the full 80 million expensed out. All right, 
<clears throat> so that was with some kind of performance condition that they had to meet. They met it, so awesome. What if the plans have to do with market conditions? So if the target is based on changes in the market, so how much the stock is worth, then compensation is recorded as if there were no target. This makes it a little bit trickier, so we don't know how probable it's gonna be that it meets market um, expectations. So they go ahead and show the compensation expense regardless of whether or not the market conditions are met. A lot of companies are moving away from these because it does, after all of these um, fraud schemes that have happened, companies say, you know, or investors look at it and say, you know, if it looks like the managers are being compensated a lot by how well the company does, what if they are going to skew the numbers? And that would be a bad thing. So it makes the investors and creditors concerned after having other companies do those kinds of things in the past. All right, so we've talked mainly about executives and how executives earn stock options, but what about the regular employees? Is there a way for them to get shares of stock options? So the employee share purchase plans, that allows all employees to buy shares directly from their company at some kind of favorable terms. So not just like anybody else, they have some kind a favorable term that they get to purchase these options at. So the intent of this is to encourage the employees to have ownership in the company. Hey, I want my company to survive. I care about this company. Plus it's another way, another incentive for the employee to work there because they have these options to buy the stock at favorable terms. So let's see, a lot of times they do not charge them brokerage fees. Um, but the criteria to make sure that this is, that we do not have to actually report it as compensation expense, so we can just show it as shares being bought, they have to meet all three of these criteria. All of the employees would have to be able to participate. Employees have no longer than one month after the price is fixed to decide whether to participate. And this is the big one we're gonna see here that um, you're gonna have to decide in your homework the discount is no greater than 5%. So if there's a discount to the employee of, five, of more than 5% for these stock options, then we have to show that difference as compensation expense. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. So as long as they meet all three of those criteria we just discussed, it is non-compensatory. So in other words, they do not have to record compensation expense. If they are not all met, we do have to show compensation expense. So an example, an employee buys shares of no par stock under the plan at a 15% discount on the current market price of $1,000. Okay, well, 15% discount, that's more than the 5%, so we're gonna have to show some compensation expense. So this is what our entry would look like. We're showing that the employee is buying $1,000 worth of common stock, but they're only paying 85% of that because they're getting a 15% discount. So they are giving cash of $850. Since it's more than a 5% discount, the difference between the market price and the price they actually paid is $150, the $1,000 times the 15% discount we're gonna to have to show that as compensation expense. So we kind of talked about this already, about how um, people who are analyzing the financial statements might be concerned if they see that management has a really big um, portion of their compensation in these shares because they say, hey, they, they might change the numbers, they might have some personal um, reasons to make it look like the company's making more money than they are. So that's basically what all of this says. One way they would do that is to manipulate the numbers to lowball the data that goes into that option pricing model. Remember, we don't have to calculate it. They always give us the option pricing amount, but they could lowball that and make it more favorable for them. So for that reason, people are stepping away a lot from these options. All right, moving a little bit past that, we're gonna talk about earnings per share, which is a number 
that so many investors and creditors look at when they're trying to decide which companies to invest in. So you've probably heard of earnings per share. You see it as the acronym EPS, and it really is one number that helps to summarize the performance of the business. Of course, there's other things you should look at as well, but this is one of the big numbers that people look at. So it helps us to be able to compare different companies that may be different sizes, maybe very different industries. If we can compare the earnings per share, then that really helps out. The higher the number, the better it looks for us. So the basic earnings per share calculation is earnings available to common shareholders. And we'll see why it doesn't just say earnings, why it says available to common shareholders. We're going to see that in a few minutes. Divided by the weighted average number of common shares. Outstanding. So again, we, we can't just say the number of shares outstanding. There's more details into this. And you're going to see how all of that goes into play. <clears throat> Mainly, we're, going to, we're first going to look at the weighted average number of common shares outstanding. That's because the reason I do weighted average is because the number of shares outstanding are going to change throughout the accounting period, possibly. You know, we might have a certain number of shares issued at the beginning of the year, but throughout the year we issue more. Maybe we buy back some of those. So that's going to change the weighted average number. The earnings available, the numerator here, available to common shareholders, is going to be changed if there are dividends to preferred shareholders. So here we just want to know for the earnings Per share, we just want to know what's available for common shareholders. So let's look at a simple example first, and then we'll get a little bit more complicated as we go into it. How's that sound? All right, so this company reports net income of $154 million in 2018. They have a tax rate of 40%. We really don't care about that in this equation. Um, they have 60 million common shares outstanding. Okay, so we don't have any extra shares that we have distributed throughout the year. We haven't bought any back. We don't have any preferred shares. So this should be a pretty easy calculation. We're just gonna take the net income. You don't have to worry about the tax rate here, divided by the shares outstanding. So that's gonna give us an earnings per share, an EPS of $2.57. So pretty simple. Of course, we can't stay simple. It has to get a little more challenging and we'll get more and more challenging as we go along. But we have the same scenario, except on March 1st, there was another 12 million shares sold. Okay, so the, the January shares, they were available all throughout the year, but the ones in March were only available for 10 out of the 12 months. So we have to do the weighted average. So we still have net income of the 154, nothing's changed there. We still have the 60 million shares that have been outstanding the whole year, but now we're gonna add in the 12 million shares, but we're gonna multiply that by 10 out of 12 months because that's how long they were actually outstanding. Then we add those together to get 70 million. This is going to change our earnings per share to $2.20. It decreased because there are more shares. All right, so additional shares distributed are gonna change how things look. We've already looked at um, the increase of shares from selling the shares. We know that whenever we sell shares, our assets increase. The shareholders have paid money to buy our shares and our equity increases, right? But then if we actually have a stock dividend or a stock split, we really are just increasing the number of shares. So we have the same size pie, just more slices of the pie. We have not actually expanded how much we have in assets or in equity. We've just given everybody a little bit more. It's kind of like if you played a board game and everybody got to move ahead one space. Well, if everybody moves ahead one space, did anybody move ahead one space? So if you give all of your stockholders additional shares, does anybody really own any more of the company? Not really. So that's kind of how the difference between selling the new shares versus giving a stock dividend or a stock split, the same type idea is. 
So let's look at how that will affect us. On June 17th, there's a 10% stock dividend distributed. So all of these shares up here now have an additional 10%. So let's see how we would calculate that. We're taking all the same numbers, except we've added this in red. For those 60 million shares, there's now 110% of that, 1.10, 1.1, because we have an additional 10%. So we're gonna multiply the 60 million shares times 110%, 1.1, and that's going to tell us how many shares there are now for the ones that were there all year. <clears throat> then for the new 12 million shares that we had 10 out of 12 months, after we calculate that, we're going to multiply it by the 1.1 on that as well, because we've increased those shares. So now there's more shares, and now that is going to make our earnings per share go down even more. Still nothing has changed with the net income. All right, so what about if a company reacquires their shares? We talked about this in the last chapter. What if a company buys back their shares as treasury stock or they retire their shares and they may not ever issue those shares again? So again, we're gonna only use a fraction of a year, but we're gonna subtract these shares in this case because they are no longer outstanding. They're issued, even if it's treasury stock, but they are not outstanding. So on October 1st, we got three months left in the year, 8 million shares were reacquired as treasury stock. Okay, so all the black here is the same stuff we've already done. Now we're gonna subtract out 8 million of those shares, but not for the whole year, only for three out of 12 months, October, November, December. So we've got all these same numbers. We do not need to multiply these 8 million by the 110% <coughs> because that was already added in back here. So we're just subtracting 8 million times three out of 12 months. So times 25% of it. So make sure we subtract that because those are no longer outstanding. This is gonna increase our earnings per share because now there's less shares available. So that was all having to do with the denominator, the weighted average of the shares that were outstanding. How about when it comes to the numerator, talking about the earnings for common shareholders? So that's going to be changed whenever there's preferred shareholders and they are entitled to preferred dividends. So we have to subtract out the preferred dividends before calculating the earnings available to common shareholders. If they are cumulative preferred um, stock, if it's going to be dividends, even if they didn't issue those, we still are going to subtract those. So the best thing I have here is to try a little example ourselves. So on December 31st, 2021, Mamma Mia Corporation had outstanding 960 million shares of common stock. Then they had 12 million shares of 6% $100 par cumulative preferred stock. No dividends were declared, but we don't care because it says they were cumulative, so it doesn't have to be declared. Net income for the year was 1,512,000,000. The tax rate was 25%. We don't have to be concerned with the tax rate in the earnings per share calculation. So let's calculate the earnings per share. All right, we have the outstanding shares of 960 million. There were no other shares issued or reacquired, so that gets to be our denominator, our base of our equation. But since we have preferred stock and it is cumulative, we're going to have to calculate what the cumulative dividends would be. So what we have, the way we do that, in case you don't remember from the last chapter, is we are going to take 6% times the $100 par times the 12 million preferred shares. Okay, so to figure out what the dividends would be, the cumulative dividends for preferred stock, we take the 6% times the $100 par times the 12 million shares. That gives us $72 million. So whenever we do declare dividends for the preferred shareholders, they're gonna get $72 million before the common shareholders get anything. So we're actually gonna subtract the 72 million from the 
1 billion, 12, 512 million. So calculating that myself here, that's going to give us 1 billion, 505 million. So we're going to take that, that's going to be our earnings available to common shareholders. We're going to divide that by the 960 million shares. And that's going to give us a dollar and 50 cents as our earnings per share. All right, please let me know what questions you have and I hope that you have a great rest of your day and I hope you enjoyed learning about earnings per share.